Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's program of Violins of Hope. Uh, just a quick thing to get out of the way, masks are required indoors on campus by all at all times, uh, so thank you for adhering to that policy. We are honored to be uh, presenting a small part of the Violins of Hope uh, event that's happening throughout Berks County, which is brought to us by Reading Symphony Orchestra and the Jewish Federation of Reading Berks. Uh, I want to thank um, David Gross from the Reading Symphony Orchestra for bringing this project to us originally way back in the summer. Um, and just to mention real quickly, um, this is part of something that's very important to the musician Pincus Zuckerman, who has a performance coming up next week um, in Reading at the uh, Santander Arena on Saturday, November 13th. Tickets are still available. And I bring that up not only because it's part of Islands of Hope, but we're also partnering with Pincus um, in the spring, in, on April 20th, we have the Pincus Zuckerman Trio, and they're, he's going to be working with our orchestra students doing a master class as well as a, a public performance. So uh, it's pretty exciting if you get, want to see his solo orchestral work uh, next week at, in Reading, and then come back in the spring here at KU and see his chamber music uh, presentations, which is his other love. KU Presents offers uh, the community a series of concerts and other entertainment by professional touring artists, for those of you who are new to us tonight. Our season is always made possible by the generous support of many, but I first and foremost want to thank Kutztown University uh, for supporting this type of program, and our very supportive president, Dr. Hawkinson, who's in our audience tonight with his wife, Anne-Marie Hayes Hawkinson. I also want to give a special shout out tonight to our KU Music Department uh, for all of their help. This evening, uh, they present a program ever since COVID started called Music Mondays. And so they're partnering with us tonight too by allowing us to use uh, this program as their Music Mondays um, feature. And I, I want to especially thank Dr. Peter Isaacson, Dr. Maria Asteriadu, and Professor Kurt Nikonin, as well as many of the uh, students that will be performing tonight, all of the students that will be performing tonight. Uh, I'm just so impressed, and, and many of you that came in early heard the string orchestra um, perf uh, practicing, and so everyone knows that you're in for a special treat. Uh, we also want to thank Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, Hampton Inn and Suites, Kutztown, Berks County Living, Adams Outdoor, the Center 100 Hotel in Fogelsville, and all of our subscribers, donors, and ticket holders. They make our season possible as well. Uh, I also want to give a quick shout out to Berks Fiddle Fest. Um, formerly known as Lions Fiddle Fest. They helped us with uh, some of our reception things tonight, including bringing two amazing artists, uh, Judy Twilliger and Joseph Arnold, uh, to perform for us this evening. This evening's performance is being live streamed, and we already have quite a few people logged online, uh, which we started right before I came up on the stage. So I just want to say hello to those people tuning in virtually. And um, I think we'll leave it at that. Are you guys ready to begin the program? It is my honor. It is my honor to uh, welcome to the stage next Amanda Hornberger from the Jewish Federation of Reading. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Violence of Hope Reading is a community partnership with the Jewish Federation of Reading Berks and the Reading Symphony Orchestra, and we're honored to be here tonight to share the violins with you. The violins are on display through November 14th at three locations. We hope um, if you didn't get a chance to see them before the concert that you go after the concert to the Sheridan Arts Building where you can see the violins on display. You can also see violins at the Goggle Works Center for the Arts and Alvernia University and again through November 14th. We have a full slate of programs and events. There's something for everyone. There's concerts, lectures, films, and of course concerts where you can hear these violins being played. One of our goals is to tell these stories through the power of individuals, and we're doing that through our educational outreach and helping students remember the connection between individual choices and individual um, actions that happened in the past. And these violins all have their own stories. Some of the stories we know a lot of details about, and unfortunately, some of them have lost, been lost to time. But we ask that you spend some time this evening thinking about the people who played them, the people who listened to them, the people who were comforted by them. It's my great honor to introduce Afshi Weinstein, the um, son of the, one of the violin restorers who's brought Violins of Hope to us all tonight, and he will tell you more about the individual stories behind these violins. Afshi. <laughs> Thank 
Good evening. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, I hope you'll enjoy it. You're about to hear some of the instruments which belongs to our foundation. Uh, the very first one that you'll hear, it's a klezmer instrument. This was, uh, these were instruments that uh, were used by Jewish musicians, folk musicians. This was an extremely widespread tradition all over Eastern Europe. Um, but klezmer musicians had one big problem. When the war started, when the Nazis opened the ghettos and the camps, they also opened orchestras. But because the klezmer musicians were self-taught, they didn't know how to read and write notes, and they couldn't play in the orchestras. Many of them were either killed or simply never played again. And this uh, extremely widespread tradition was basically extinct in Eastern Europe. There is a revival of klezmer music in the past uh, 20, 30 years, mainly in the United States and Israel, but it's never been revived again in Eastern Europe. Um, we have today in our collection, in Violins of Hope, about 90 instruments. We display them like you just heard. Here we have three exhibitions. We have a very extensive educational program. Just this morning we had here, I think, about 350 students from uh, middle school, and it was also streaming to two or three other uh, schools as well. We have school presentations basically every single day for these uh, two weeks, sometimes two, three times a day. Friday, um, Friday, Amanda did, I think, eight different lessons. I didn't do them. I'm really happy for that. Um, but uh, this is one of the main things that we try to do, to talk to these kids, to tell them the stories that they can hear, also the individual private stories of some of the people who died, some people who survived, that they can understand that the Holocaust, it's not just the numbers, it's not ancient history, it's something which actually happened a very short time ago, very, very short time ago. And even though the survivors are already in their late 80s or 90s, and unfortunately many of them passed away, those instruments and these stories will keep on being here, being told, and go with us around into many, many other places. You'll hear more from me very soon, but uh, we'll start with the music now. Thank you very much.
the song you just heard, uh, Yiddish Mama, it means a Jewish mother, but as someone who lives in Turkey, and I see the way my mother-in-law treats our kids, I think it, uh, it works for every mother everywhere. She always makes sure that they eat and uh, be fed no matter how much they ate a minute ago. Um, I do still remember my grandmothers sing this song sometimes when we had holidays at home. Um, this was uh, one of the main Klezmer uh, songs probably being played on violin in God knows how many different versions over the years. Um, but unfortunately, as Klezmer music, it was extinct. We don't really have any notes from that. The collection that we have, it's a collection of stories of people, of single people who managed to survive, managed, some unfortunately died. I'll talk in a few minutes about one of the other instruments that we are going to hear here. But uh, if you will have a chance to go and take a look in the exhibition, which is just next door, or the other two exhibitions that we have around Reading, you see stories of people who just try to survive, try to have their families survive. Some of them manage. But there is one thing that lots of people forget. After the war in Israel, there was one very big thing missing. My father was lucky enough to, that his parents immigrated to Palestine, to Israel in 1938. But my grandfather, who came from a very big family, was one of 11 brothers and sisters. Only one of his brothers stayed alive. My grandmother was one out of seven or eight. We don't know because she never said anything. None of her family survived. And when my father went to first grade in Tel Aviv in 1945 or 1946, the first day there were about 36 students in the class and the teacher said, kids, how many of you have grandparents? And this is one of the things that basically didn't exist in Israel. Only one child out of 36 raised their hands, raised his hands. Grandparents, unfortunately, the vast majority of them did not survive the war. Many of them were killed almost immediately. Um, the violin that you just heard, the Klezmer violin, it's dedicated by my father um, to Ponar. Ponar was a, a forest, a recreation area just outside Vilna where um, my grandparents were coming from. But uh, just a few weeks after the invasion of uh, Russia by Germany in June 1941, beginning of July 1941, the Nazis murdered about between anything between 70 to 100,000 Jewish people just in that forest. This, is, uh, this was one of the very first mass killings in unfortunately many more mass killings to come. And the violin you just heard is dedicated to this mass killing in Ponau Forest outside Vilna, where it might be that some of our family died, but unfortunately we will never know. So we will hear the second piece of music. I know it's not easy to play after these kind of stories, but uh, I'm sure they're gonna do a great work. Thank you very much.
to Manfred Katz. Manfred and his, and his wife, they lived in Germany before the war, but as they were Romanian citizens, when the war started, they were simply banished from uh, Germany. They had to leave everything behind. The only thing they managed to take with them was the violin that Manfred got from his father. And later on, when they were in Romania, when Romania joined uh, the Nazis, they were sent to the ghettos, and still the only one thing they could, they could take with them and they took with them was Manfred's violin. The violin stayed with Manfred and his wife the whole war, all the way after they immigrated to Israel. Unfortunately, they never had children, and later on, um, I think it's about 15 years ago approximately, we were given the violin by Betty, Manfred's wife, and it's uh, one of the instruments that we have in our collection. One of the other violins that you will hear in a short time, it's basically the very first violin that we got with a story from the Holocaust. It belonged to a person named Shimon Korngold. And Shimon Korngold was a wealthy industrialist in Warsaw before the war. And the violin is a, a very beautiful instrument, was made by a Jewish violin maker, Yaakov Zimmerman in Warsaw. It has a beautiful label in Hebrew and it says, I made this violin for my loyal friend, Mr. Shimon Korngold, Warsaw, 1924, Yaakov Zimmerman. 
It also has a small Star of David on the back. And uh, from what we know, when the war started, Shimon Korngold managed to run away from Poland. But unfortunately, after he arrived to Tashkent, he got sick and died. In the 1947, one of his best friends arrived to Jerusalem and he found the Korngold family in Jerusalem and gave them the violin. And after my father spoke on a radio show in 1999, asking people if they know stories of musicians who survived or passed away in the war, and if by chance they have their instruments, the next morning, the very first phone call was the guy, the, uh, I think he was the, niece, uh, the nephew of Shimon Korngold, who called us and said that he had his violin and we have it since then. Now, Yaakov Zimmerman and Shimon Korngold both were tied to other Jewish musicians. I don't know if any of you know the name Ida Handel, the very famous Jewish violinist. Ida Handel was a child prodigy. She told my father that, uh, and me that she remembers growing up in Warsaw that her father used to take her to Yaakov Zimmerman, the violin maker, and she remembered him as an older person, probably in his 70s, during when she was a child in the 30s. I don't really know how old she was when she met Yaakov Zimmerman because I knew Ida Handel for about 20 years and she always said she was 80. So I'm not 100% sure, probably she was in her teens. We never heard of Yaakov Zimmerman after the war, but like I said before, usually people in this age in Eastern Europe, they did not survive. Um, Shimon Korngold and Yaakov Zimmerman, they also were tied to another very famous Jewish musician, Michel Schwalbe. Michel Schwalbe was later on the concertmeister of the Berlin Philharmonic, one of the top three orchestras until today in the world. And he told my father that when he was growing up in Warsaw, he was coming from a very poor family. They never had any money. And he remembered that all his instruments were given to him for free by Yaakov Zimmerman, but his family was too ashamed to bring the violin teacher home, so his violin lessons were usually done at Shimon Korn Gold House. He became later, like I said, he was the first concertmaster of Berlin Philharmonic, playing under Karajan, the conductor, who was a very enthusiast neo-Nazi, actually, but still his most favorite concertmaster was the little Jewish boy from Warsaw, Michel Schwalbe. Michel had to run away, of course, from Germany, but after the war finished, he got back his old job in Berlin and played in the orchestra until he retired. So we'll have some more music, and I'll see you very soon. Thank you very much.
this is one, one more time you'll see me tonight. Um, we don't have time for questions tonight, but uh, one of the very frequent questions that we are asked is, how do we get the instruments? So there isn't really one answer for it, but I'll give you an, an example. We're going to have a very big project after here in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, this project was uh, supposed to start in March 2020, but you know what happened. Um, and in one of the concerts that were done before the project there, one of the conductors, a woman conducted the conductor of the Jewish Symphony in Los Angeles. She had a house concert talking about the violence of whole project and what they are going to do and this and that. And after the concert, a lady came to her and said, you know, I have a violin. And the violin has a very interesting story. This woman's mother, she was a child in the Netherlands. She was a prima ballerina. And um, when the war started, she was also playing violin. And after a while, she managed to run away with her mother and her sister. They were hiding in a very small farm in the north of the Netherlands, surviving from whatever they could actually eat because the Netherlands were suffering from a very strong starvation. And when the war finished, she survived. She went on back to stage. And um, in the end, a few years later, she met uh, someone that I'm sure you all know, J.F. Kennedy. And uh, he invited her to come here to the United States and uh, to work and study and teach here. He signed her a visa coming here. And I think it, she's told me that it was about a year since she came her mother also played in a movie with Ronald Reagan. I mean, of course, why not to have two presidents in one year? It's not so bad. But uh, the story of her violin got a very interesting twist in the 1990s. One of uh, her mother's best friend, friends, uh, she went to see Anne Frank's home. Now, I don't know if any of you have been there. I haven't been there. I've seen some photos. but. Apparently, Anne Frank had some photos above her bed of a few people. Among them, there was a small girl giving a very nice pose that I'm not going to even to try and show you here as a ballerina. Um, and nobody knew who was this girl. And this was the mother of this woman. And for so many years, nobody knew it and until her friend came to Anne Frank's uh, museum, saw the, the photo, called her friend and said, you know that your photo is just above Anne Frank's bed. They were neighbors, they didn't know each other, um, but uh, somehow probably Anne Frank heard about this girl, this ballerina, and for some reason she simply kept her photo above her bed and it was there for many, many years. So this is the latest instrument that we got to our collection. I'm going to get it when we will be next month in LA. And um, hopefully we will get many more instruments. And I think now it's time for more music. And I'll see you very soon. Thank you very much. We have a, can we have a big hand for Avshi for taking his time coming here? It's the first time that the Violins of Hope have been here in Pennsylvania, and, and we're just so moved and honored. Thank you, Avshi. Uh, <laughs> there are many other chances to hear Avshi talk, to ask him questions, even though we don't have time tonight. Uh, just go to um, violinsofhopepa.org and you can see there's still many events happening. But also the exhibits. Um, there are over 40 instruments on this tour and there are only three places with exhibits here in, per in Berks County. And KU is honored to be one of those places just next door in the Sheridan Art Building if you have not been there already. We have a number of violins there as well as the stories uh, behind them and other things about regarding the Holocaust. 
Uh, it's very powerful. It's a great exhibit. And then there's two other exhibits, one at the Goggle Works and also at Alvernia University. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, Karen Stanford, who I'd like to also thank, uh, who runs the gallery, has agreed to keep the gallery open tonight if you'd like to go, if, if you have time this evening right after the program to just swing in there and check it out. You're more than welcome to. Um, I once again want to thank the KU Music Department, and I also didn't get a chance to thank the KU Art Society. Earlier today, Avshi spoke to uh, the entire Kutztown University, or Kutztown Area Middle School. Um, they were all here in person today, and um, Nico, who is uh, Nicolas, <laughs> Nicolas, come on out a second real quick, just to wave. Um, I'm sure you've seen him if you've seen any of our performances. He is an incredible virtuoso musician, and he performed for the students today. Thank you. Nicolas uh, Gomez Amin, am I saying that correctly? <laughs> yes. Um, and so he performed for the students today, and we also had many schools, uh, including Fleetwood and Hamburg, and one of the Reading schools uh, tuning in virtually as well. So that was a really uh, amazing event brought to us uh, in part by the KU Art Society. So I just want to thank them. Uh, and I also, of course, want to thank all of you uh, for joining us this evening. Um, keep in mind, in case, in case somehow it was lost on you, the soloists are playing the actual instruments, the strings of the Holocaust. And it's hard not to be moved by the history of what they're holding and what happened to those people that originally played them. But then also to know that they also stand for them. The people playing them today are showing the victory, how the Nazis didn't win, and how there's hope, and how we're keeping their spirit alive through the music and bringing it to a new generation so we never forget. So thank you again for joining us. The rest of the program will be by our music department. Um, they're going to come out and play. The program is in your playbill if you didn't see it. And I just want to thank each of them for taking their time to be part of this program tonight. So thank you again, and I pass it over to the music department.
So this is the last time for tonight. Um, I'll start with a small remark. The nigun that you just heard, the last time I heard it being played on that violin was in Auschwitz-Birkenau in 2008. Uh, there was one documentary which was made on violins of hope and we went to Auschwitz and Birkenau, it was a part of the documentary. And I heard it being played there by Shlomo Mintz, very close to the same place which hosted a very famous violinist. Her name was Alma Rosé. Her father, Arnold Rosé, was the concertmeister of the Vienna Philharmonic for many years. He was actually the legendary concertmeister of the orchestra until in 1938, after the Nazis took over Vienna and Austria, he was basically thrown from the orchestra. He took his daughter, Alma, his wife and the whole family, and they moved to London. Now, Arnold Rosen and his family converted to be Christians many years before the war. And Alma, she had a very successful women orchestra touring Europe, playing light valses and light music. And living in London, in England, she couldn't do that. She missed those, this life of concerts. She went back to Holland, to the Netherlands after a while. And when the war broke, she was caught there by the Nazis. Her uncle was Gustav Mahler, who also converted to be Christian. And still, later on, Alma was caught by the Nazis and she was sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And she was, if you can use this word, celebrity, she was a kind of a celebrity in the concentration camp. The Nazis knew exactly who she was. They knew who was her father, her uncle, all her legacy. The only person that we know until today who was addressed in her private name in the camps was Alma Rosé. They used to call her the Nazi god, Mrs. Frau Rosé, Mrs. Rosé. And um, Alma was put in charge of the women orchestra in Birkenau. Auschwitz had many orchestras, not only the men orchestra. In the main camp, there was also a dwarf orchestra made by uh, by. Uh, uh, Joseph Mengele and many, many other orchestras all around. And Alma, Alma believed that if the women will play hard, play well, play many concerts, the Nazis will keep them alive. So she made the women work and practice every single day. And she was right. When the war ended, 22 out of the 24 women in the women orchestra survived. And not only that, one of the women from the orchestra, one of the years she became very sick, she was sent to the clinic. And usually clinic in a concentration camp means one-way ticket from the clinic, it go, you go to the gas chambers. And Joseph Mengele was taking his daily tour in the clinic and he saw this woman laying down in very bad condition. And he asks the nurse, he says, why is she still here? And the nurse says, well, she belongs to the orchestra. He walked away and the woman lived. Alma herself, unfortunately, did not survive. She died two or three months before the liberation. But uh, like I said, 22 out of the 24 women survived, which is an amazing number if you compare it to the rest of the population of the concentration camp. So sometimes this was the power of music, the ability of musicians to simply stay alive and survive the war. I hope you enjoyed this night, and I think we can dedicate this last piece, the Bach for Three Violins, to Alma Rosé, because the only piece she ever recorded was the double Bach, Bach uh, violin concerto together with her father just a few years before the war. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the evening.